is it goes from like 20 million one year to 100 million the next year. So there's a lot of fluctuation in that. Um, as far as the idea, agriculture is uh, probably the biggest people in this because you know, they buy and sell tons of land and property. Um, and so that's that's really been the heartburn of capital gains for the most part. It's mainly the agriculture community, which is using a huge number of um, so, But as far as it being a funding source, it's not a good funding source. I mean, um, it's my understanding it'll bring in like 60 million, 60 million. If you average out all of the years, um, and there's a there's a chart, but if you average out the years, it literally goes from 20 to 100 back and forth. So on average it's 60, but let's say you built a budget next year, you could have a 40 million dollar shortfall potentially based on what it does. So. Are there any other bills then if you don't think that one's a good one? Is there another one you look for as far as the, uh, funding education? The, the ones we, I think we should do are more shell back here. We've looked at a lot of wind credit stuff up here. We saved a half a billion dollars on Sunset and Down uh, Our district doesn't have wind problems. So, the heart, again, it's, it's geographical. Up in Northwest Oklahoma, their schools are off the funding because it gets so much out of the wind tax. And so, you have mainly your legislators from Northwest Oklahoma. They have a lot of heartburn about it. And I think there's more we can do with it. It would be constant revenue. Um, Production tax, for example, on wind. Uh, it's, it's less fluctual. Hey, how are you doing? <laughs> Y'all know she's former Purcell area, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. And she's got OPEA in the family, too, right? I do. And so she's. Working. So the Purcell members we get to talk to a lot. Yeah, so. she's working double time. Yeah, she's kept us connected. These guys are engaged. Yeah. They come in here every day and are just close. We have concerns living in your district that the past two measures going for education for us teachers you go to name. We're on the taxes. Yes. I did not know. Um, I, I think that's a hard thing for me. It's been a hard thing for me to explain. It really has. I voted yes on it on on the whole series of bills that were presented on that. I voted yes on a lot of things that freed up money to do it. I would vote on reallocating money. The tax proposal with fuel, especially, uh, it may be supported 13% in our district. So, so there is a tension. There is a tension between how many I hear from that say, don't raise, and frankly, a lot of retired people. A lot of your more elderly people are the ones that on cigarette tax and fuel tax have the biggest concerns on raising uh, what they would call aggressive or consumption type taxes. And so, so that has been my biggest challenge. Um, it's one of those things where I committed my vote. There was a wind vote coming up that filled it off. As a caucus, you commit your votes one way or another. So I committed to things that didn't go on the board. Uh, I didn't commit to that. I didn't need my vote for that tax package, but it, it wasn't something I felt that uh, our district supported at, at a tax level. And I'll tell you too, I've gotten some emails, mainly Paul's Valley. I know Paul's Valley people are up here, but about the, if it goes on a ballot concern that it would get repealed. And, and that is a reality if, if you pass a tax that the public doesn't support it. It could happen. 1017 went on the ballot. Uh, it passed. It was affirmed by the people. Uh, so it might be. But with fuel tax in there, it makes it really susceptible because everybody buys fuel. You know, and so, yeah, that's kind of why I feel like the idea, we kind of discussed this earlier, was that it's, we don't want to make anyone mad with the capital gains, but it's super okay to keep putting taxes on us. We all drive, we all have fuel. Right. It just feels like we should be a little bit more of a priority. Yeah. You know? And in the end, if I get, if you don't want to tax, then how else do we fund education? I mean, I get you saying I don't want to waste taxes, but. So well, there we get are that millions money? of dollars in credit savings options. I mean, there, there are, and there's, um, 
do you I guess I would ask it this way. I mean, I think there's those that have said, well, hey, can we, can we, there was like the 65% rule. I think Todd Land put that out this week about funding going to classrooms, being prioritized to classrooms. I know the logistics of that. Ginger Tenney was one. I don't, and y'all may be at the same position that talked to me and said, hey, in tight times, that's great, but if you don't have total dollars, allocating a percentage to go to a particular place, uh, isn't as helpful. What What are y'all's yeah, thoughts on that? Schools generally meet those requirements all the time, anyway, right? I mean, there's a limit on how much you can put toward administration. Yeah. So, I mean, if you wanted to like yeah. do fewer tests, it would be you know would put more money in the classroom. I mean, that's an option. Yeah. But, but for the most part, you know, administrators. I mean, there's you can only have by law like what four percent of your budget I think goes through administration. Administration. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I mean, I just don't think that's very helpful. But, I need more money. That is, I mean, that's, is that the primary, my understanding, y'all can tell me, is the, the, the teacher pay raise, you're, you're, you, you like that, you're appreciative of that, right? And then so it's more about funding in the classroom for materials, textbooks, you know, updating the facilities. I'm a special ed teacher. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They need basic supplies. Yeah. Yeah. Paying them enough, yeah. it's they stay. The good ones yeah. stay. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. a joke. It, it, it's yeah. ridiculous. And, and, and I don't know about anyone else. And I'm just, the twelve hundred dollars a year for the support staff is insulting. That was insulting to me. And I'm a teacher, and I've been teaching for over twenty years. Yeah. And I feel like they are a backbone of some of these classrooms to help us get our job done. And we also want to remind you that. The more we put into education, the less we put into the prison system. Because if you go into the prison system, most of those kids did not finish their education. They are, and it is a dumping ground for mental health issues. So when you start cutting us, when you start cutting mental health issues, you're just pouring it into a prison system that is already broken, and those people aren't paid well. That's a great, great I mean, and so this is. I think what we're saying is we are more than willing to take a, a cut. We have no problem with that. The, the money was nice, and, and it isn't for me. I'm retiring soon. This is for these young ones. We want them in Oklahoma. I want them educating my grandchildren. And I want good teachers to stay here and educate my children to be a great state. But if you don't give us some money, they're leaving. And I can tell you that my district, we they're leaving in droves. I was offered a job sight unseen, thirty thousand dollars more a year. Sight unseen. No, I mean in McAllister. McAllister, okay. And, and, we just want everyone to possibly know that it isn't only just about education. Education is it's a jumping off point. There's so many things. So the, and so if you find that, we touch so many lives. So, so I think the agreement on the funding package that uh, was just Y'all have watched the last year and a half on, you know, a 76 or 75% of the agreement. So I, I think the funding package, 